Welcome into another episode of Harmonious at Lunch. I am personally jacked up about this episode. We have a unique guest today and one in the nonprofit sector. We've had a couple of nonprofit guests on before, but this one, her name is Nicole, and she has a wildly different approach and outlook on how a nonprofit should operate. And guess what? It's what I always say about nonprofits and what we always say about nonprofits at What If. We have a soft spot for nonprofits, and we're going to dive in today. This is a very unique story, and I promise you, you will love it. But before we get there, Harmonious. What's Harmonious? Why are we here? Harmonious is the 10 fundamental disciplines every single business needs to master in order to thrive, scale, and grow and run an efficient business. And not mastering them or not acknowledging them is what causes chaos in your business and your life. We're here to fix that on this short episode. Enough about me, enough about what if and Harmonious. Let's bring on our guest, Nicole. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Brandon. Yeah, I'm super, here. super excited for you to be here and, and share your story and what you're doing in the world. So let's let's start there. What are you doing in the world? Well, Eden is a nonprofit. And what um, we like to say is we use uh, everyday rent to change the world. And how we do that is really um, what we're trying to create is change the way people think about giving. So there's that traditional giving model that I think we're all familiar with. You know, someone's in need of water, you provide the glass of water, and then tomorrow, you know, they're in need of water again. And so uh, Eden approaches it a little bit different. What we are all about is, you know, taking donations and doing the hard work of creating a well that is going to produce that life-giving water for, um, you know, years, generations to come. And for us, our goal is to help support anti-trafficking organizations, you know, to really strengthen them um, in three different ways. So we have uh, three pillars of what we do in order to help support these organizations. First, it's structural. So I think that really ties into, you know, what you guys are all about at Harmonia. You know, we really want them to be empowered with um, the same resources that you would find in a for-profit organization. And so, for instance, I mean, business consulting, marketing specialists, financial advisors, technical support, even those are often on the back burner for these organizations. And because of that, you know, they're running these races, uh, limping along, trying to to do the best that they can, but they don't have that structure. And another area that we found uh, lacking in some of these organizations is just finances. I mean, monthly, they're asking for you know twenty dollar donations here and there and uh, you know in light of things like inflation uh those donations drop you know their whole plan for that year oh, okay repivot we we got to go somewhere else and uh, i mean it's really not effective at doing the work that they were created to do i mean we're all gifted in different ways and um, we want to allow them to focus on their mission, <laughs> focus on the areas that that they were that they were meant to to create. Uh, lastly, what we do is we focus on just like personal fortitude. The workers that are in these organizations, you know, oftentimes they're you know meeting people with dark stories, you know, and oftentimes that can be weighing on the person that's trying to help bring them out of that and they're not really sure how to process it and there needs to be just ongoing you know psychological spiritual support for for the workers even to be able to stay there for the long haul um, so what we try to do as an organization we are not the the boots on the ground but we are there to support the boots on the ground to assure that they're there next year and that they're not one of the statistics of these nonprofits that fall because um you know maybe there's a, a lack of financial management or a lack of donations or, you know, just leadership that needs to be empowered there. Yeah. I, I love how you're doing this. It's kind of, I, I hesitate to use this term, but I'll, I'll say it anyway. You can correct me. It's kind of like you're the middleman between for-profit companies and supporting nonprofits to help them enable them to continue on their mission without having to worry about the financial piece of it. And I, I think that's, very important and it's a fantastic role but you you said something that 
I don't, I don't know if anyone's ever compared the stats back and forth between nonprofits and for-profits. Uh, you said typically for-profit companies focus on the strategy and the financial pieces. You'd be surprised. That's the unfortunate <laughs> message. We run into so many people as, as consultants, as fractional COOs, I'll, I'll, so many people come to us because their finances are in disarray. Their calendars are chaotic. They have no plan. They have no strategy, no vision. And running a nonprofit and a for-profit are really the same thing. It's just your mm -hmm. money goes in different places. So um, I, I absolutely love the approach you take to this. So then looking backwards, where how did you get to this place? Like, how did you come to to realize this, there was a need in the marketplace for this and create this company? Cause it's a very unique, uh, it's a very unique company and situation. So how'd you come about it? So <laughs> I, I'm thinking, I'm going to take you all the way back and then you uh, I'll, I'll speed it up as we go. But uh, for me, so just a little background on, on myself, you know, I have a background in business development. I work with a lot of uh, small businesses um, and I have, I started having kids <laughs> and you know, you're going into the office, you're traveling all the time and then your whole life changes and you start thinking, Oh wait, this isn't really what I want to be about. I, you know, I have these little people that need me and um, it, it became like a catalyst for change. And honestly, when I started having uh, my children, it was like a countdown. I was like, Oh no, like literally I am seeing them grow up before my eyes and I'm spending, you know, all this time in the office. I, uh, I started reducing my travel. I started trying to like figure out ways to, to work more from home. Um, but like my ultimate goal was I felt stuck and I needed to be able to stay home with my kids. And um, a lot of my girlfriends at the time, you know, they were selling essential oils, which was awesome. But I was like, that is not equivalent to how much I make. Like, I can't, I can't switch this. I mean, you know, uh, especially living in Southern California, <laughs> it's, it's a, a different world. Um, and so that is what got me into real estate investing. I like finally found something that I was like, wow, okay, this is like minimal time commitment, maximum return. And uh, I mean, really in terms of just like one step at a time, whole different channel of uh something that you're like learning and you, you just I, I literally felt like i was jumping off a cliff <laughs> into this and being like well uh if i don't change anything nothing's gonna change so i gotta i gotta go for it and so uh really it was like love for my kids that like made me jump off the cliff um and thank god i did because uh doing so uh, i wouldn't realize but years later it was going to help us create what, what we're doing now with Eden. And so getting into real estate and realizing the power of it after just that first purchase, I mean, I was addicted. I was like, oh, I was telling my husband, we're going to pull out money from our 401k. We're going to just like keep doing this. This is like way better returns. Um, and I was like naturally talking about it to people. And I was like, I'm not selling you anything. Like literally, I'm just telling you, do it, do it. Just like try one uh, because of the power of that like monthly cash flow. And so um, fast forward a few years, um, my husband and the two other founders of our organization all had the opportunity to go to Thailand and they were, you know, seeing trafficking firsthand and just a little bit, I mean, I don't want to say a little bit, like fully overwhelmed by the magnitude of it. And so um, coming back, my husband was just like, you know, it was like on his mind. He was like, we got to do something. Like, I don't know what we're going to do. Um, at the same time, our friends who had also gone were like, oh, like this is irking me. You know, there was like, a, again, one of those moments where you're just like, I, I got to jump off a cliff into something that's going to make it a bigger impact than what we're doing right now. And granted, we were all already donating to anti-trafficking, but we realized like, hey, there, are, we got to, we got to be able to amplify this. It's, it's not going to make the impact that we want in our lifetimes <laughs> unless we do something bigger. And so I was sitting, uh, listening to Diana Bautista, who is the founder of Share Love International, share her story. And it really captivated me personally. Um, basically, 
she <laughs> told a story about being in Thailand herself and seeing, you know, this underage boy being trafficked. And in, in Thailand, this is illegal, even though Pattaya Thailand is unfortunately known in circles as, you know, the number one sex trafficking region in the world. So she, she reports it and then she goes home and she, she talks to her brother and she's explaining, you know, this whole situation with this, this underage boy and how she reported it and how, you know, she's not really sure that anything is going to, to come of her reporting it. And rather than just meeting her with like, oh, that's tough, you know, he like challenges her and he says, you're a grown woman, you need to do something about this. And she's like, I, I mean, I did, I reported it, you know? And uh, and she's sitting there going like, I mean, what else can I do? I'm like a hairstylist from, you know, California. So, but, you know, when when that seed is planted and somebody is calling you to something bigger and they see something that like, like a lot of times we like live in this state of disempowerment, right? I mean, like that same feeling I felt when I was like trapped in, uh, the workplace, and I'm like, ah, I'm a mom now. What do I do? It's 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 this thing that we meet all the time in business. I mean, you it's like the next wall that's in front of you, and you make the decision: Are you going to like? Are you going to get over that wall? Are you going to break through the wall? Or are you going to just sit there and stay in the comfortable, you know, and like ignore the the elephant in the room? And so she ends up going, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in. Using her skill as a hairstylist, she moves to Thailand, starts a school, and she's bringing people, she's inviting them out to learn a trade. Because uh, in Thailand, it's a little bit different, it's very different than uh, trafficking here in the United States. I mean, the, you are talking, you either eat or, or you die, and the way that you're going to eat is probably offering yourself um, just in service, right? And so, I mean, it's, it's this, again, this prison that they're finding themselves in and she's bringing hope and she's saying here like learn this trade there is another opportunity you don't have to be stuck in that and um when i heard that story i'm like sitting there in the seats bawling my eyes out but not bawling my eyes out because there was no hope but because i was realizing like hey i am that grown woman i need to do something like what what do I have to offer here? Um, and so all of us, all four of us <laughs> were like going through our own like little inner um, transformations at that time. And my husband, I remember I was sitting um, at the office because at that time I was still working, you know, uh, two days from the office and, and then home the rest of the time and sitting in the parking lot. And he called me and he was like, what do you think? Like, can we do you know what we do for ourselves can we can we make this work somehow for uh this organization and then it was like exciting because we were no longer like feeling this overwhelm of like this is this is bigger than we can tackle it was like oh okay how are we going to to like make a difference in this and uh you know we're talking with our friends and and all of us are are real estate investors and so that was really like natural for us to to be excited about this. But uh, what really got us excited was when we shared it with others, everybody that gives wants their, their money to go farther. They want it to be a bigger impact. And so when they see, hey, there is a way that I can make like a legacy here and not just this one-time donation, uh, it's, it's contagious. And so, um, I hope that answered that question of where it started, how we got to where we where we are and you know what's kind of like keeping us going. Yeah, I mean it's it's such a heartbreaking story too. And this is an unfortunate reality around the globe. And there are people like you who are are helping the problem. And more people need to step up, of course. But I love that you have a a proactive sustainable solution. And I want to touch on that for a second too, because that's the most important part. Now, nothing I'm about to say is political. I'm not, we're not taking sides here. It's just very relevant, uh, relevant, excuse me, examples of how this plays out in the real world. So we always say to nonprofits when they come to us, they, they're like, we need help getting more donations, more fundraising. What are some fundraising ideas? And we say, you're asking the wrong questions. 
it's not fundraising ideas. It's revenue generation is the key. You have mm -hmm. to be a business, right? We've kind of touched on that at the beginning of this episode. So once we establish that little mind shift, then we can move forward and figure out the how. But the other part, a good way to illustrate this is two different ways. First and foremost, the Girl Scouts. That is the easiest example of a nonprofit mm. with a for-profit revenue stream. They sell cookies and they do it door-to-door -door with child labor. Love the Girl Scouts, but <laughs> it's kind of funny that they have little girls going selling cookies door-to-door. -door. Um, and they make a ton of money for their cause and they're able to do great things in the world. And the other way that's maybe a little bit polarizing, but that you can think about this, especially in terms of, of real estate investing, is in Manhattan. If we take a look at President Trump, former President Trump, his name is on the building. He can make a lot of change. If if you look at that as a nonprofit who's has a revenue generation stream like you, real estate investing, and then you look at the homeless man sitting outside with his handout, which one is more likely to impact change in the world? It's probably the guy who owns the building, right? And that is unfortunately why most nonprofits fail because they just have their handout. And I absolutely love you can see if you're listening or watching wherever you are you can see why i'm jacked up about this because nicole and eden have obviously gotten this right and i'm so excited to follow along your journey and this story um so i know you've been doing this a little while tell us a little bit about the unique way that's different about how you actually proactively have revenue streams and how you're using real estate investing to impact and drive this change forward Sure. So uh, what we do is we would take your donations. We would a hundred percent of that donation would go to the purchase or the rehab of an actual property. And so our first property, for example, we purchased it outright. We are renting it out. And there is a portion of that money that gets held back in order to keep our organization running and to make sure just in case, you know, a pipe breaks, a toilet seat, you know, for a rental. Um, that's something you would do as a as a real estate investor traditionally. You know, you have these line items, but all of the profit then gets poured into these anti trafficking organizations. And so our first uh, purchase is supporting Sheer Love, that uh, the organization I mentioned earlier. And then we actually purchased another property recently in Ohio that we are in the midst of rehabbing, and that is going to be our first property for supporting a local organization in the United States. Um, called Oasis House. And the exciting thing about that is, you know, after that property is rented, you've got this ongoing monthly cash flow that is pouring into these organizations. And for example, Oasis House in the United States, uh, we spoke with the, the leader there and she mentioned, oh, you know, I would love to bring a consultant in here because we have certain things that I know we could do better. But right now, it's really hard to get that pass through because it's not, you know, a top priority for them. And yet, you know, there's these leak, leaks that are coming out where she knows that, you know, if she had the resources, she could stop those leaks and they would be powerhouse, right, <laughs> of, of doing more change. And so um, we had her, we gave her, you know, um, a pre-donation before we even have this current house that we're raising the funds for up and running. And I remember seeing the light go on for her because she wanted to give us back that donation because she said, oh, no, here, I want this house to be uh, quicker, uh, done faster, because in the long run, this is going to help support my organization. And, you know, for us, it comes out of two different buckets, so it, you can't mix them. But uh, we realized, you know, she saw the power that this is going to help her in the long run be able to do more of what they were created to do, more of their mission. I absolutely love that. And you can see you've, you've made the shift in her head, right? Between just collecting donations and fundraising to proactively making money and how a sustainable revenue stream could really drive impact in her organization. I absolutely love the change that you are driving in the nonprofit sector, in this country, in sex trafficking, and in all these beautiful areas. Um, I, I love this. I put uh, Nicole's website on the screen. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about people, how people can get involved and support you and your organization and follow along? Yeah. Um, so I, I do want to just give an example of uh, the creativity that we've seen in our donors. I mean, we, we also have a um, children's author, Pam Prouty, who uh, uses a, a portion of her book sales. So as she grows, you know, we grow as well. So, I mean, it's not limited to just, uh, 
you know, donating in the traditional sense. I really want you guys to like break out of that. It's it's really through innovation that we grow. But if you go to our website, we are raising funds right now for this house in Ohio that is going to be helping to support Oasis House. And the faster we get that place rehabbed, the quicker it is going to be producing and, and creating that support. So if you would love uh, to, to reach out to me, feel free to, to sign up online and um, we'd love to talk more. That's so cool. Yes, definitely go there. Check it out. Uh, if you're listening, it will be in the show notes. If you're watching, the website's on the screen. will also be in the show notes. And Nicole, I can't wait to have you back for a follow-up because I'm just so excited to follow your journey and see how this can can change the world of nonprofits. I think what you're doing is absolutely amazing. Um, thank you for being here. And to tie this to the architecture, to the harmonious architecture, we talked about all of it. We talked about harmonious. That's the secret. Running a thriving business or nonprofit is about leveraging the 10 disciplines and making sure they are in the optimal state that they can be. So if you want to know where your business stands, get a little bit of clarity into your business. Uh, if you're watching or listening, go to, I'll put it on the screen here, whatif.com. You could take our free eight minute assessment that will give you instant clarity into the state of your business in all 10 of those disciplines. And you'll get a 12 page report on the back end that will tell you where you are, what needs to change and how to fix it most importantly. So if you would, if you need help, if you want to grow your business, if you want to know how Nicole's doing this for her company, how she's done it for other companies in the past, and ultimately how to build the company that you want to build, start there. We'd love to have you. We'd love to help. And we love helping nonprofits too. So, so happy to bring Nicole on here. Uh, feature her story, get her word out, and hopefully we can do the same for you too. So wherever you are, make sure you subscribe. Nicole, thank you for being here. We'll see you next time on Harmonious at Lunch. Thanks, Brian.